the fifth episode of RGSL Chat Chamber, we welcomed Vita Matis, who is a visiting professor at RGSL. She's not only a professor, she's also a historian, essayist, independent political commentator, and an expert of public diplomacy. We discussed Latvia's public diplomacy image, propaganda, soft power, as well as her involvement with RGSL. Hello, this is the fifth episode of RGSL podcast, The Chat Chamber. We are very happy to host Vita Matis, who is a visiting professor at RGSL, teaching global approaches to public diplomacy. Very glad to be here. So, uh, as you already, everyone know that Marta and Christopher is here as well, and we are the hosts and the founders of this podcast. So we are very happy to welcome a new guest every two weeks. And I would like to start, as I <laughs> tend to do, uh, with a quote. And uh, every quote that I start this podcast is a bit provocative, but not too much. <laughs> and uh, this time I want to quote Winston Churchill, who has said on the topic of diplomacy that diplomacy is the art of telling people to go to hell in a such a way that they ask for directions. And I would like to know your opinion on this quote as... You know, diplomacy is something that develops with states and the political situation and um, has something changed since the time that Winston Churchill uh, was in power uh, and working in Great Britain as the prime minister? Or, uh, how does it work today? I think a lot has changed uh, since Winston Churchill was uh, prime minister uh, and in power. Uh. And yes, uh, uh, Churchill is, has many, many pithy and very good quotes. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you've attended quite a few conferences now yourselves, and it's uh, almost inevitable, inevitable that uh, participants or moderators will quote Churchill. You know, that's uh, <laughs> of to show their bona fides. Uh, so, uh, but yes, he was, he was a good writer. He had good observations. And... Uh, I think somebody like him, who was a real statesman, uh, today uh, some of his asides and some of his, uh, uh, let's say, bon mots that he came out with, I don't know how they would resonate in the diplomatic world today, but I think the main issue is there is just so much we don't know about Winston Churchill, really, is, isn't there? Because back in those days, there was no social media. Um, he, he drank a lot. That's yeah, something that is quite well known by and a cigars. lot of people. <laughs> um, but it was not known uh, by the public at the time. We know it now because we've read the memoirs, we've read mm -hmm. uh, uh, accounts uh, of those times. But while he was a leader... Uh, his uh, tendency to take a sip or two of whiskey, a uh, sip or two or more, uh, was not widely known in the populace. Uh, so I think that's the first enormous difference, uh, is that the dividing line between private and public, uh, which was quite defined back there. I mean, you know the famous uh, stories of, uh, of the things uh, John F. Kennedy could get away with, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, no president could g get away with today, uh, that what uh, Winston Churchill could do in his private life uh, back then that didn't get much attention, uh, and more importantly uh, than the fact that it didn't get much attention, is the fact that the populace did not know uh, uh, that doesn't apply anymore. Uh, I think this uh, idea that you can have a private life or that you can uh, do things that nobody will ever know about uh, has very much mm -hmm. uh, disappeared uh, in today's political and diplomatic life. So I think that's one of the one of the main uh, differences that uh, uh, he was quite a character. Uh, but I'm not sure, uh, had uh, the public known just what a character he was <laughs> back in the time that he was a leader, uh, whether that would have gone over so well. Would you say that perhaps we all, it's always about only revisiting these kind of uh, past leaders and past, uh, past people and understanding what was their life, lifestyle in reality, but it's al always, I think, linked 
to this kind of a revisionist uh, perspective that you, you you cannot know everything about the leader now, but you can only now know uh, about the leader in the future. Well, that's also uh, linked to the fact that there are rules about archives. Uh, for instance, official archives, uh, historians and uh, academics uh, that write books about like Winston Churchill and so forth. It's also very much an issue uh, that is linked to the fact that some archives, are uh, you cannot open them until after 50 years after the person is dead. Uh, some archives, you can't get to them uh, at all uh, unless the estate, which are usually relatives or somebody, allows you uh, or allows the one biographer uh, to uh, see the archives. Uh, so um, I think it has very little to do with uh, revisionism, which is the word that you, uh, you used, as it has to do with just the inevitable time lag uh, between the time when a leader, a famous person, dies uh, and the time uh, when access to his or her archives uh, is or permitted, and not only his or her personal archives, uh, but if he was a leader or she was a leader of, uh, of a country or a prime minister or a president, uh, when those archives, which will include correspondence between the leader uh, and the people, his or her secretary of state and so forth, once those archives uh, are open. In the current situation in America, we will probably find out that there are no archives at all to look into, uh, that uh, you know, everything was done on private email and, uh, uh, or destroyed, quite simply, uh, which goes against all the, all the laws. Uh, uh, of the land. So I think that's more the answer to uh, your question than uh, simply that it takes time to see somebody in a true light. Although that is true as well. I mean, uh, perspective, you know, the further you're away, uh, further away you are, the better perspective you, ha you have. Value judgments also, you know. Yeah, and value judgments change mm -hmm. as well. Well, this next question I'm going to touch upon is more related to public diplomacy yeah. in Latvia. And it was very interesting when I was preparing for this podcast, I knew, I get to know that you are the first person to actually lecture on public diplomacy in Latvia. Um, and it was only nine years ago. I'm, well, it could be. I'm not sure. You know, maybe somebody somewhere. But um, uh, public diplomacy... Uh, has not been a field uh, that has received much attention in the academic realm here in Latvia. There are some wo uh, wonderful uh, articles that have been written by uh, by people, you know, from the University of Latvia or uh, for el uh, elsewhere. But as a course, uh, I don't think there uh, there definitely aren't any degrees in public uh, public yeah. in public diplomacy. And uh, as we well know, uh, well, not. As we well know, but this is my personal opinion, uh, uh, Latvia could uh, use a bit more, uh, how shall I say, uh, focused attention uh, to uh, the country's public diplomacy. Yes, and that, as I, that was actually what I tried to link yeah. with because maybe there, there's this linkage that we don't use public diplomacy as a state in general and that's why we don't prepare specialists that concentrate on this field as it much. Is. Which, you know the chicken and egg situation. Yes, you know, yes which, exactly. Uh, where's the problem? You know that's <laughs> uh, that could be the the case. Well, Latvia uh, somehow it's not that Latvia hasn't done anything in the field of uh, public diplomacy. It's done it by fits and starts. In the two thousands, uh, there was an effort uh, to use some uh, public relations and branding uh, gurus like Simon and Holt. Uh, uh, to raise the profile of Latvia in the field of public diplomacy using the branding approach. And at that time, one of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Anholt came up with, I think in collaboration, I'm not absolutely sure, but I think in collaboration with the uh, Latvian Institute, uh, was the idea or the slogan, uh, the land that sings. Um, which is fine, which is, you know, there's uh, a certain you know, basis uh, for that, although a lot of countries sing, uh, don't they? Yeah, it's, uh, Italians sing and so forth, and, <laughs> and this reminds me of uh, quite an amusing uh, uh, anecdote. Uh, last year in the course here at RGSL, 
uh, there were a lot of Erasmus students in my class. I think I had nine or ten Erasmus students. Um, a couple of Italian uh, lovely, uh, lovely students. Uh, and uh, I was telling this story about, well, one of the things that came up for Latvia uh, back in the 2000s as a possible slogan, as you know, Marta, I, I, in, in the class I teach, you know, that, well, Poland had creative tension, you know, and Norway has, you know, peaceful nature and uh, Germany had land of ideas for a while. And then I said, yes, and then Latvia had this idea of branding itself with the slogan, the land that sings. And then this very bright Italian student, you know, kind of raised it. I, I don't really understand. Uh, I said, "What don't you understand?" Um, you know, very nicely. I said, um, "What does that, you know, mean?" Uh, and then I realized she thought it was the land that sinks. Oh. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a native, you know, I'm a native English speaker, and I think I said that rather clearly, mm -hmm. the land that sings, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I just thought to myself, then, wow, you know, if a native English speaker, is, it's difficult to make it clear what this idea, and it can be misunderstood as the land that sinks, <laughs> that's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe we need to think about a different slogan, you know, that's maybe not the, uh, irregardless of the fact that maybe it's not the right slogan because a lot of countries uh, sing, including Italians, uh, yeah. uh, that it can be misinterpreted, you know, the pronunciation uh, can just make it go, go, go this way. So to answer your question um, less anecdotally, uh, that in more in depth, I can say that Latvia has made efforts, you know, uh, but they're always belated. They're kind of always behind the curve. Uh, uh, for instance, Estonia, uh, they already in 1989, uh, before Estonia was even uh, an independent uh, mm -hmm. country, they created the Estonian Institute. And the head of the Estonian Institute at that time was Lennart Meri, who subsequently became the, uh, the first president uh, of Estonia. And uh, so they realized very quickly that they needed to get uh, the message, the idea, the brand, although you know I don't like that word, <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> uh, the brand of Estonia out there already in 1989. Uh, Latvia created its Latvian Institute only in 1998, so almost 10 years later. Uh, so. Uh, they were way behind even the Estonians uh, in this kind of a uh, effort to increase their profile on the international stage. So there has not been a concerted effort uh, which involves all the different ministries uh, and most importantly with the understanding uh, that public diplomacy involves uh, both many different goals and many different means. For instance, public diplomacy, okay, uh, my students know I'm not a big fan of branding, but I do agree that branding does need to be used, for instance, if you're trying to sell soap mm -hmm. or if you're trying uh, to uh, increase your exports in your country. Okay, then you need a very, very uh, hierarchical, top-down approach uh, when perhaps it's a very good idea that all uh, of your... Uh, export efforts are under the aegis of one slogan or something like that, 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 that it's a united approach close to the government uh, ministries, which is not at all the case uh, for cultural efforts. Cultural uh, diplomacy, uh, you cannot have a hierarchical top-down approach. Uh, you need to have an arm's length approach. Let the artists, let the cultural people uh, do their thing uh, at, uh, at quite a remove from government. Support them financially, but give them uh, the means uh, to express themselves freely. Because in cultural diplomacy, it's really not a good idea to be perceived as being too close uh, to government. And this is one reason, for instance, uh, the Goethe Institute uh, in Germany, it was very, very careful when it was founded uh, not to be perceived as being an arm of the government because the Germans had just recently had a, 
uh, bad experience uh, with, uh, with propaganda, uh, with uh, cultural affairs being run by Mr. Goebbels. So, uh, so they were very careful to separate uh, the cultural diplomacy mm. uh, and from government activities. So I think this has been the main problem uh, in Latvia in the field of public diplomacy, not realizing, for, first of all, uh, that you need all of these different uh, approaches. You mm -hmm. need, yes, you need to export. You need to, to uh, stimulate the economy that way. But you also need uh, to promote cultural diplomacy. And that both of these uh, different, uh, uh, different approaches, uh, different how shall I, uh, goals or tools require completely different approaches. They need to be coordinated. In the UK, they're coordinated by a public diplomacy board, uh, but they need to be able to uh, both, and not only both, there's also tourism, mm -hmm. there's also advocacy, there are a whole, you know, there's a whole panoply, there's a whole uh, diapason yeah. uh, of uh, different uh, tools that are used in public diplomacy. And Latvians have tended... Uh, first of all, to concentrate on one uh, and not realize that all of these tools need to be used and they all require different approaches. What is the role of soft power in today's uh, world, in your opinion? And is it still as powerful as it was 10 years ago? Perhaps it's even more powerful. Uh, what would be, in your opinion, also other good examples of... Uh, well, let's say country branding, all right, mm -hmm. uh, today that we should perhaps uh, inspire, be inspired from. Well, uh, there are various schools of thought mm -hmm. on this, you know, soft power. There are some say it's just an academic exercise. Yeah. Uh, some say that uh, it's uh, just one of these newfangled concepts uh, made up by an American uh, professor called Joseph, Joseph Nye, Nye. Uh, that... Uh, you know, that he's become quite uh, famous for. And there are those who say, well, you know, soft power is just a luxury uh, for those who have hard power. Uh, that it's, uh, I think one person said it's like putting a bikini on a, uh, you know, uh, a pig. You know, it's, uh, but it's still a pig. You know, that's so much. Uh, um, so there are various schools of thought. But I do think uh, one thing that Joseph Nye has said, which is extremely important, uh, uh, and pertinent uh, to this day and age is his famous quote, which goes something like, uh, in the information age uh, today, uh, it's no longer so much uh, whose army wins uh, as a matter of whose story wins, uh, whose narrative, whose story is going to win. Uh, in that, and in that sense, I think, yes, soft power uh, uh, is uh, quite an important, the narrative, the story that you have out there uh, about your country, uh, because uh, it goes back to the famous uh, uh, quote by Neville Chamberlain in 1938, uh, when there was the, uh, uh, the Munich Pact, uh, you know, when he says, well, you know, we, do we really want to go and protect... Uh, and go fight for a country uh, way out there in Eastern Europe uh, that nobody knows anything about. Uh, so for Latvia, I would say, um, we need to make sure that we are not one of those countries uh, that people around the world think uh, is this little corrupt appendage to Russia, you know, way out there somewhere in the gray area uh, between Russia and, uh, and the West. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to firmly anchor Latvia's narrative uh, in another niche, which is to say that Latvia is an old European civilization, uh, uh, that it is uh, a cultured nation uh, and so forth, which would, uh, if push comes to shove, which we all hope uh, doesn't happen, but you, but you never know, uh, that uh, the president of France and the chancellor of Germany, uh, that if they have to convince their populace that uh, Germans and the French have to go to war to defend mm -hmm. Estonia, Latvia, uh, and Lithuania, uh, that their populace is convinced that these countries are not some 
corrupt little appendages of Russia there, but they're ancient or at least old civilized countries. So in this sense, yes, I do think uh, the story you tell about your country or the image that other people have of your country is extremely important today. Mm -hmm. uh, and let alone we could raise the whole issue of uh, cyberspace and uh, how the image of a country is uh, formed uh, in social media and elsewhere. So, uh, yes, I think in that sense, uh, soft power is uh, very important. Maybe not so much as an academic exercise, but uh, definitely in the sense that, yes, uh, armies are still important, but stories have become uh, much more important than they ever were, precisely because of social media. Mm -hmm. uh, there comes this uh, question, then, uh, whether um, every kind of public diplomacy is uh, good, I mean, unsuccessful cases as well. Because I remember that we talked in the lecture about Gribu Tevi Atpakal, mm -hmm. and actually it has a good purpose, but uh, it ended up being unsuccessful. So here comes the question whether maybe Latvia is being scared of um, the fact that it may not lead to the uh, result it actually wanted, or it cannot be said like that. I'm not sure Latvia is scared. Uh, that I, I don't think that's really the, the, the problem uh, uh, right here. I think part of the problem is that there's never been a, uh, a very systematic examination, in-depth examination, uh, by uh, the Latvian powers of B, of all the different examples in public uh, diplomacy. Uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you need to look at what the Swiss did after mm -hmm. the scandal in the 1990s with the uh, dormant assets, uh, Holocaust ass assets, when suddenly the Swiss, who were always, you know, just uh, lying, you know, very sitting on their laurels, very happy with the fact that uh, everybody had a good image of Switzerland in this lovely neutral country with lovely mountains, you know, high Land, the land, land of chocolate and and uh, and watches and and trains that run on time, and suddenly you have this whoom. Uh, suddenly you have them in the nineteen uh, in the mid nineties. Uh, uh, you have a negative image of Switzerland, which the Swiss were not used to at all. Uh, when it, it was found out that uh, basically the Swiss banks had been keeping in their coffers for 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 many many years. Uh, the assets of, of dead Jews. Hmm? Uh, so, and then the Swiss very quickly realized they had to do something to improve their image, and they quickly got together a, a public diplomacy pro uh, program. Um, so you could cite a whole s uh, slew of examples like this. What did other countries do? Uh, and I don't, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong, I have never seen an in-depth analysis uh, in Latvia, of here is what all the other countries, you know, this is this approach, which is very appropriate for a small European country uh, that has had colonies or hasn't had colonies. This approach is very appropriate for a country, uh, a Central Eastern European country, uh, which just uh, uh, reattained its uh, independence in 1991. An analysis like, like this, because of course, the public diplomacy approach of a, con a superpower like America or China is going to be very different uh, than the public diplomacy of approach of a country like Norway uh, or uh, the Netherlands or, or Denmark. So I've never, perhaps it's my fault, I've never uh, you know, had access to this report uh, where there's been this analysis that this is what all, the, this is what these countries have done and as a result of this analysis, this is our conclusion that this is what Latvia mm -hmm. would be best, you know, this as an example of best practices. These are the best practices. And this, uh, as a result, is what Latvia, uh, this is, in our opinion, is what Latvia should do. And I've, uh, I've never seen that. But in reference to your example, uh, Marta, about Gribu uh, Tevakpaka, yeah, or we want you back. Uh, just for those who don't know, it was a campaign by the Latvian Institute um, uh, targeted towards those Latvians living abroad, uh, inviting them back to Latvia. 
But I think inadvertently this campaign touched on an issue which is actually an issue that uh, Latvian politicians don't like to uh, bring up very much. Yeah? Mm -hmm. As you know, Latvians uh, or Latvian politicians are talking a lot about the demographic problems in mm, Latvia, indeed. which uh, to, uh, you know, which is an issue. But which kind of, what flummoxes me uh, is the fact that while they're talking about the demographic problem uh, in Latvia, no one dares to bring up a very related issue, which is the fact that Latvia is the country in Europe which over the past 20 years has lost the largest part of its population, population. almost one third, 29%, minus 29% in the past 20 years. It's, the, it, it's number one in Europe in this sense, uh, whereas other countries like Switzerland, it's plus 30%. Uh, so not mentioning this factor when you're talking about the demographic problem in Latvia, I think is, is bad faith. Uh, because of course, if you're going to bring up the issue why you have minus 29%, well then you have to bring up the whole issue, well maybe people have left, not to be, just because uh, salaries are larger uh, in Germany or higher or whatever, but also because people start thinking, well maybe when I get old or if I get sick, I'm not going to have the care uh, that I would get in Germany or elsewhere, or maybe, you know, I don't, I don't come from a very well-connected family, maybe I won't be able to get a job in Latvia because I don't have the correct connections, uh, you know, there's not an open competition for the, for the best jobs and so forth, so uh, maybe the education system uh, lags behind what is happening in Finland and Norway. Maybe all these other issues are the ones that also the people that have left are thinking about. And maybe a simple campaign of I want you back uh, is not really addressing the fundamental issues uh, uh, that led these people to leave Latvia in the first place. So I think there needs to be some intellectual uh, and political honesty mm -hmm. uh, in dealing with these uh, issues. Uh, why do we have this number one ranking, which is not very flattering to Latvia? Uh, you know, what led to that? Uh, and when you're talking about demo uh, uh, demographical problems, be honest and bring this up too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yes, actually that was uh, one of the questions that I wanted to add that uh, why is the situation, how, how do you think about educational system as well? Because we don't have that much programs in universities that actually provide studies in English, for example, just, mm -hmm. just alone English, because we have SSC, we have RGSL, mm -hmm. which are, well, we... Well, there are other several programs mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there are several uh, in Riga programs. Business School and, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, but still. Yeah, but not that many, and mm -hmm. I mostly privately funded to, uh, to some level, uh, at least, and then if we compare to uh, Estonia, which is uh, which Latvian does, uh, that uh, <laughs> University of Tartu, its yeah. rankings have raised in the last eight years for 250 places in the, the world university rankings. But if we look at Latvian universities, it, it's, not, it's not happening. And then Latvians, uh, especially the young, how say youngsters, adolescents, they leave our country to get education uh, and uh, abroad, mm -hmm. and then they enter the work market immediately there, and the salaries are higher, the quality of life mm -hmm. is higher, and uh, Latvia is basically uh, losing uh, its uh, future uh, in that that way. Brain drain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's not be completely negative here. Of let's uh, no. uh, let's uh, change our register uh, uh, a bit here. I'd like to uh, put some perspective on this. So. Um, and to say that uh, comparing uh, uh, the education system in Latvia today with what it was in 1991, 1992, 1993, in the early 1990s, uh, comparing the students, uh, because I taught pro bono at the University of Latvia in the early 1990s, uh, along with my, with my main job, 
uh, just because I wanted some intellectual stimulation because I was dealing with a lot of uh, construction mm -hmm. issues and uh, a lot of budget issues and so forth, and I wanted a little bit of in, uh, intellectual stimulation. So I did teach one a couple of courses at the University of Latvia pro bono at that time. And first of all, I can say that the student quality has definitely improved. Uh, uh, that the participation, the understanding of uh, uh, what is expected uh, of students. And of course, here at RGSL, uh, you have a wonderful system called Turnitin. Uh, and one of the big problems at the University of Latvia, uh, not only University of Latvia, uh, other universities that use Latvian, uh, in Latvia has always been plagiarism from the 1990s. That was an old Soviet kind mm -hmm. of a, a unfortunate uh, a holdover. But with this system turned it in, uh, there's not much opportunity for plagiarism, uh, is there? And I think the person who discovers a turn it in system uh, for Latvian, uh, I think that would do uh, you know wonders for uh, you know killing this aspect mm -hmm. uh, of. Uh, negative aspect of the Latvian higher education system. Uh, but I wanted to say that uh, I compare the students uh, and what I saw when I taught in the early 1990s uh, with what I see now, and there has been definite progress. So, uh, uh, but I will also say that when I was working uh, in Latvia in the early 1990s, and precisely because I saw what was happening at the University of Latvia, and uh, I was very involved uh, because the foundation I worked for uh, was very involved in uh, starting up both this school and the Stockholm School of Economics uh, uh, in Riga. Uh, we were very adamant about the fact that you cannot reform from within, that you need to create something anew. Uh, this was a principle that was quite firm at the foundation, that uh, especially concerning law, uh, that given the state of the law school at the University of Latvia, uh, that we needed to create something from scratch. Show by example. Yeah, well, quite simply also because the time and the effort that would have to be put in into reforming from within. That would be... Uh, that it would just, the timeline uh, would be just so long. And also, I mean, the tour de force uh, for getting something up and running is actually the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. I remember from our first discussions uh, in 1992 when that building was an absolute ruin and there, was no, there were no teachers, no professors, no students, no programs, nothing, no building, no classrooms. 1992 to the time when the King of Sweden visited to inaugurate and to have the first, uh, that was 1994, two years to get that, that would have never happened had you had to reform something from within. And that is thanks to one person uh, who is unfortunately deceased now, uh, Staffan Bernstam Linder, uh, who was uh, the rector of the Stockholm School of Economics in Stockholm. Uh, also subsequently uh, the uh, chairman of the Central Bank of Sweden and a a deputy in, in the European Parliament from Sweden as well. A bright person. Actually, we would like now to change our direction towards you as uh -huh. a person. Mm -hmm. Because you, you were born and raised in the United States. Mm -hmm. And one of your parents, or both of your parents, are Latvian. Mm -hmm. Both. Both. And how I'm interested, how were you raised uh, in the United States as Latvian? How how is your childhood? How it happened? Were, were you speaking I I in Latvian back home uh, all, all while you were at school talking in English? How, how was it? Did you say that there was a double identity also? I never perceived it mm -hmm. uh, as such. It was just natural that at home we spoke Latvian. You know, you're just kind of switched. You know, once you walked in the door and you uh, went home, you, you spoke Latvian. But once you went outside, uh, it was uh, it was English. Uh, um, but it was quite simple because my grandmother l lived with us. Uh, and because she arrived in America when she was already pushing 60, uh, she never really learned English. Uh, so if I wanted to speak with my grandmother, 
uh, it was only in Latvian. My mother, she, you know, she went back to school. She went to university in America. She got a teaching degree, and uh, she integrated very, very easily. But my grandmother, she was too old, quite simply. Uh, so uh, in the home, we spoke Latvian. Uh, my mother was a choir director, a Latvian choir director. She was even a Virsdirigens at Latvian. <laughs> in fact, I think uh, on the West Coast was the first woman... Um, uh, uh, top top conductor. I don't know how you translate. Sir, I, how do you how do you translate that in English? <laughs> that's such a, conductor in chief. Uh, right. It's uh, that slips my mind uh, as well. Anyway, it's a big deal here in Latvia, mm -hmm. and uh, you may not know this, but the first woman uh, uh, main conductor for one of these song festivals. Uh, was in 1973 uh, the Derkevich, uh, and that was considered a big deal for the first time to have a to have a woman. But my mother beat her by a year. My mother, back on the west coast of the USA, uh, was this top conductor for 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 a song festival on the west coast of uh, the United States already in 19, uh, 1972, and all the other ones were. Uh, were, were men. So no, my mother, uh, you know, she was very active, and my father uh, was, they were both teachers here in America. They had both, uh, uh, sorry, here, here in, uh, in Latvia, they had, they uh, had finished respectively uh, school uh, teaching institutes, and they had both uh, my mother in Liepaja, my father in uh, Gulbene, Subate, uh, Jaunpiebalga, they had been teachers, so. Uh, they had not met in Latvia. Uh, my mother evacuated from, from Liepāja. Uh, my father, after spending a year in a, in a Nazi prison in 1943 uh, in Daugavpils, together with Jews and saying horrible things, uh, irony of sorts, uh, shortly after he was left, let out, uh, let out is a euphemism, uh, his sister bribed the, uh, the, the, the guards. Um, he was, uh, well, there was a law. If you were in a certain age group, you had to join the Latvian legionnaires. And my father uh, ended up in the Latvian legion. He was injured severely uh, three times, and he was evacuated. So that's how he, in a family of seven from Latgala, was the youngest and the only one that ended up in the West. He ended up in a refugee camp in Germany, and that's where he met my mother. So he from the far, one far end of Latvia, you know, on the Russian border, in Latgala, and my mother from Liepāja, but they met in, in, uh, in Germany. My sister, uh, older sister, was born in, in Lübeck in the, in the German refugee camp, and I'm the only real American in the family. I was the only one that was actually born uh, in America on the West Coast. Uh, so yes, I did the whole Latvian school thing, the uh, you know sa Saturday school, going to Latvian school, and uh, since my mother was and was very involved in, in in the Latvian choir and so forth, went to all these events, played the piano and the violin myself uh, at several concerts. Uh, um, but I was never uh, one of these super activists. I, I was never, you know, all these Latvian camps and so forth uh, somehow were not really my cup of tea. Uh, and I left America actually quite soon. I, I left already when I was about 19. Uh, so to go to Paris uh, uh, and then back to New York for a bit, and but then back to Switzerland. So basically... Um, at the age of 21, I was pretty much in Switzerland, and I never really went back to America, uh, and uh, just to visit my parents and so forth. Uh, so, uh, yes, that's uh, Latvian because that's the only sp language my grandmother, you know, really understood. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I learned it as well, and I uh, spoke it with my parents. Uh, but when I really learned Latvian, is uh, I did my dissertation at the University of Geneva in Switzerland uh, on a Latvian topic. Uh, I advise all my students uh, to not to do what I did. Uh, I advise them all to take a dissertation topic that is limited in time, uh, limited in resources. For instance, the relations between 
uh, Andorra and the Vat Vatican between uh, 1971 and 1972. You know, as narrow as you can make it and they have the archives be right there. I didn't follow my own advice at all. Um, so I had archives basically all over the world, including in what was then uh, occupied uh, Soviet Latvia. Uh, and these archives uh, were very difficult to get to. Uh, I should never have chosen the dissertation topic I, I chose for the for this reason, but of course, uh, you know we're uh, we we like to follow our passion when we're young. <laughs> so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Well, it's, uh, an <laughs> it's it's an it, it wasn't the easiest way to get to get a doctorate, um, uh, but that's when I when I started working with the academic texts because my feeling is you never really learn a language unless you study in the language. Uh, so the kind of uh, mastery of Latvian that I had with just you know, speaking with my parents or social events uh, in America, uh, I really mastered Latvian only when I started uh, reading academic texts and so forth in Latvian. Okay. Um, I, we have a more like a general uh, question now. Uh, so Joseph Nye, which we uh, already mentioned, has said that the best propaganda is not propaganda, mm -hmm. right? In the situ and, and so in other words, we perceive something to be true, but it is not. And are there particular examples you have seen in your lifetime of this? And how did you feel about yourself or others believing about, uh, well, believing in something that wasn't true in the end? Well, of course, this uh, determining whether something is true or not is much more difficult today mm -hmm. uh, than it uh, was even 10 years ago. It takes a bit more effort on our part than it used to. Uh, and some people just don't want to make this effort, this extra effort to really ascertain whether the information you are receiving is uh, true or not. So, uh, and I think this is very dangerous for our democracies extremely dangerous today, that uh, uh, this extra effort that is required uh, to double, triple check whether our information uh, sources uh, are valid uh, or not, are true or not, because this, the whole notion of truth uh, has become something that is being questioned, and that is also very dangerous, uh, not only for our democracies, but for, for our planet. <laughs> Uh, uh, as such. Uh, and uh, if you can convince people in their heads that two plus two is five, you know, the two plus two is not four, two plus two is five, is the famous passage 1984. in uh, 1984 in Orwell's yes. uh, book uh, goes, uh, uh, then you've won, haven't you? Uh, you don't even need to change the reality outside. Uh, uh, if you can change what ha is happening in somebody's head, uh, then what the reality is, what the actual truth is, doesn't matter anymore. And I think that is what is happening uh, more and more. Uh, those countries and those powers that be uh, that want to convince people uh, that two plus two is, uh, that the reality is two plus two, two equals five, that that is the truth, uh, they realize that it's, they don't need to, uh, you know, to try to prove any new mathematical theorems or even try to change the reality as such. Uh, if they can get into people's heads uh, where they believe that, uh, that's a much easier uh, and in the end cheaper path. Uh, uh, and this goes back to what I said earlier about narratives, about stories uh, being very, very important. Uh, uh, if you can get a false story out there that people believe, well, you've won, haven't you? Hmm. So, I think, I think, sorry. Yeah. I think that yeah. it, uh, it just came up to my mind that that's basically what happens now after United States elections because Trump is basically stating that this all uh, <laughs> elections, like it, it was fraud. Mm -hmm. It was just like nothing was true. Uh, the uh, vo voters uh, are just uh, manipulated with and the Biden is not, <laughs> not the winner. And... There are part of the society that actually believes him, and he, I think that he has, at some point, even succeeded to get his 
propaganda to work. A large part of American society uh, yeah. believes in you know, a much larger part than people would like to believe. And I think this is one of the big mistakes that uh, what we like to call the West, what they made in the uh, early 1990s uh, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, this was imagining that, well, it was such a stunning victory and such an overwhelming victory uh, in 1991, 1992, there was the illusion that uh, there would be this continual, continual progress uh, and that uh, democracies would not decline or don't decline. And uh, uh, there was the illusion that, um, you know, there, there would be a incremental but constant uh, progression uh, in, in a de democratic direction. Uh, but I think this was underestimating human nature uh, because we must understand that uh, for a lot of people, more than we would, uh, at least I would uh, like to, to believe, but uh, there are a lot of people that find demagogues really quite appealing. You know, that's uh, uh, found them appealing uh, demagogues in the 1930s and find them appealing today. And there are a lot of people, uh, usually the same people, uh, that uh, find any kind of complexity very unappealing. You know, they like things in black and white, simple, good guys, bad guys, cowboys, Indians, um, black and white, anything that could be more complex or so forth or more difficult to, to, to digest, um, they find that unappealing. And I think we, uh, as a rule, underestimated that uh, in the early 1990s, uh, that there will always be these people. Uh, you know, uh, in some countries there are fewer of these people uh, because of better education or so forth, uh, but all countries have them. No country uh, is uh, an exception. Uh, you can say what you want about the United States right now, and I've been reading just like you have. Uh, I read yesterday that uh, a nurse from South Dakota had posted uh, on her Twitter feed uh, that she's exhausted because she has patients that are on their deathbed suffering with COVID, uh, and they're yelling at her saying, why are you wearing all this PPE? Why are you wearing all these masks? You know, it's, it's a farce, this whole COVID thing, you know, and they're almost dead, you know, suffering from COVID themselves. Uh, and they're still, they're still not believing uh, that it's real. And she's saying the only time that they finally, excuse me, shut up is when they get intubated, you know, then they can't talk anymore. Uh, so, and she says, and this is exhausting dealing, emotionally, physically dealing with this, uh, and this is a person that has COVID in a very, very heavy form. So America has them, but as I told you, the taxi <laughs> I took to get here, the taxi driver and a very reputable firm, and this wasn't a fly-by-night taxi firm here, when I got in and we started moving uh, and I saw he didn't have a mask, um, uh, I said, oh, well, aren't you going to wear a mask? And he just said right away, he says, no, I'm not. I don't believe in any of that. So Latvia has them too. So these people that um, find complexity unappealing, that want everything to be either true or false, and they're more likely to believe all of these, uh, you know, uh, theories uh, that are fed to them. Slogans. Uh, yes, uh, slogans, theories, uh, whatever that. Uh, that uh, many organizations are more than ready to feed to them. I think this also uh, can be linked together well with your TED talk, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, as I, rem as I recall, where you said that uh, basically the, this is something similar also portrayed in 1984, right? That this simplification of language, simplification mm -hmm. of ideas, using of jargon, mm -hmm. of slogans, could you say that this is really something new, or is it, has it always been here? And perhaps it can, perhaps it can show this uh, psychological state of mind that many people have. You know, this descent 
uh, of their own, perhaps, I don't know, everyday lives. And that's just manifested in politics, I don't know. It's always been around. And I mean, Orwell wrote about it already in the 1930s, 1940s, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And I mentioned that in, uh, in the TED Talk. Uh, um, uh, but I think it's become uh, more acute uh, in, in this day and age uh, because attention spans are shorter. Uh, everybody is trying to get a, their message across in, in in five words, three words, rather than long, complex sentences. A long, complex sentence uh, takes much more time and effort to understand, let alone to compose. Uh, because of texting, uh, simple, you know, simple, uh, not even words, but smiley faces. Uh, so, I think with social media, uh, the tendency uh, has been exacerbated. Uh. Uh, of uh, this language of delusion, as, uh, as I called it. Uh, and also, in this day and age, we also have the combined uh, effects of political correctness, uh, uh, which means that there are a lot of jargon words, a lot of uh, commonly used phrases, that uh, in the end mean nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that bureaucracies tend uh, to overuse because they often don't really have something, uh, a thought behind what they're trying to. They're trying to protect themselves, and in order to protect themselves, the quota. <laughs> they use uh, pre, you know, prepared uh, mm -hmm. sentences uh, when you dissect them really mean not much at all. Uh, I have like a follow-up question then. Mm -hmm. Perhaps this would be even more relevant for legal students. Uh, the students of law that basically are, you know, they find themselves in a situation where they see so much of gibberish sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. especially if you're a new student, right? You can be, I think, confused why the language is as it is. Mm -hmm. So how would you, I don't know, uh, how would you suggest us looking at text? How would you also perhaps suggest us writing so that we can, per, uh, per, well, convey our message in a simpler way? Very good question, very complex question, um, and I'm going to have to walk on eggshells here uh, in, <laughs> in responding because I'm not a lawyer, uh, and uh, I know most people you're interviewing are on the law side, not so much on the diplomacy side here at RGSL. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful combination, uh, the law and the diplomacy. Um, but it's not a natural combination because the way of thinking uh, and the way of analyzing uh, in both fields is actually quite different. And the language, as you correctly point out, uh, is really quite, uh, quite, quite different. Uh, uh, often lawyers, it's a well-known thing, are masters uh, of basically saying nothing, you know, saying uh, very, being sure not to offend anybody and uh, being, you know, very diplomatic in their- Sometimes in it's called legalese. Legalese, <laughs> right. Um, I'm not very good at legalese. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I tend to be a rather, uh, rather a straight shooter. And uh, I often find legal texts uh, hard going. I'll admit that myself. Uh, if I had to write a legal text, um, since I've never been trained as a, as a lawyer, I think I would find that uh, hard going uh, uh, as well. I think uh, it's a wonderful person who can master both. I'm not one of these wonderful people. I'm definitely on the uh, international relations, diplomacy, humanities side. Uh, the legalese, the legal writing, the legal uh, uh, analysis, it's a specific talent. It's a specific way of writing. Um, uh, but it can, I have read legal texts that are also very clear. You know, they're not mm -hmm. mumbo jumbo. They're even to the person who's not a lawyer, uh, it can be understood. And I think that is the sign of good writing. Simplicity. Uh, simplicity. If it can be understood, if it's not full of jargon, uh, if you can feel the idea, if you can feel also a bit of personality behind it, mm -hmm. if you can feel that somebody is actually thinking behind the text, not just pasting, you know, prefabricated. Uh, slogans uh, together, you know, th then that's, uh, that's good writing. Right. Well, uh, my question is going back a bit to Latvian politics. Yeah. Um, 
I'm wondering, if we look at uh, Latvian presidents, uh, there are Latvians who tend to say that, oh yeah, we remember Vara Vita Freiberg and she was the best, best president mm -hmm. we have ever had because during her time we joined the EU, NATO, and became, so, so to say, visible mm -hmm. to other countries. And now uh, that I uh, wonder, what is the role of the president in a dem democratic state except the fact that it is like a representative, like an, an image of a country? Is there something specific that is uh, as if we compare uh, that we had uh, have had presidents as, uh, I, don't, I don't want to mention specific names, but we, uh, we know cases where there is in the CV written that this person knows English, but at the end when he, he has to give a speech, it's a kind of Latvians feel ashamed of the way it is presented. Well, those are at least two questions right yeah. there. That's right. Um, but the role of a president in any country uh, that is, uh, well, not in any country, because there are different kinds of presidential regi uh, regimes, but if you're the kind of president that Latvia has, which is more of a representational figure, although it has certain, the president here also has certain uh, legal uh, mm -hmm. means that he or she can use. Uh, I would say that the president has, especially in, in, a, in a small country, uh, and even in a large one, we see the, that very much in, Uni in the United States right now. I mean, what was Joe Biden's uh, main message during the election? Huh? Uh, he kept saying that this is a fight for the soul of America. This was his main message, uh, that I'm uh, running because this is a fight, a campaign for the soul of America. And many people framed the election in America as a referendum on the soul of America. You know, what is America? Mm -hmm. You know, that's... Uh, uh, and so the president is, in, in a way, symbolizes is a moral leader, is a, uh, not just a moral leader, but he's a, he or she is a, uh, an etalon, you know, it's yeah. uh, this, uh, and if the president, he, uh, or he or her, uh, is corrupt, is, uh, you know, uh, cheats on, his parking ticket, for instance, we had a recent scandal here uh, in Latvia mm -hmm. with parking uh, passes, uh, little things like that. You know, if your president does things like that, so, well, that very much sends a message to the populace, doesn't it? It says, you know, well, if the president does it, you know, why can't I? Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I think this, uh, in a peace situation, uh, the president also can... Uh, serve as a uh, serve and give moral guidelines uh, to the, the this is quite simply not acceptable and this is what I think was missing in Latvia in the early 1990s uh, Estonia had it they had a president uh, Leonard Mary uh, during the wild west times of the early nine during the uh, uh, you know the racketeering and so forth that went on you know he he did draw a line. He says, no, there, there's a line uh, beyond which we will not go. And also he drew another line, which was the line saying very clearly that the Soviet Union was one regime and we are now a completely new regime. We will not, with no holdovers from the past, since he himself had been a dissident from uh, the Soviet times. Uh, he was not a uh, he was not a, a Soviet functionary in, in any sense. So that it, a very clear line was drawn mm -hmm. in that sense as well. Latvia didn't have that. We didn't have this very clear line uh, drawn, uh, either in a moral way uh, uh, or in another way. And I think that has uh, held Latvia back, since we always like to compare ourselves yeah. with Estonia, uh, has held back uh, Latvia in, in, many different, uh, in many different realms. And there, I think, had Latvia had uh, a leader at that time of the caliber of uh, Leonard Mary, uh, that Latvia would be further along today. How about personality? Uh, personality and rigor and clarity of vision.
mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, and the capacity, uh, one other thing, the capacity, you may have a clarity of vision, but you don't have the capacity uh, to formulate that and to make other people understand that. You need to have that capacity persuasion. as well. Like uh, uh, the capacity of persuasion. Mm -hmm. yes. All right, so I would say this is the last question here. Okay. Uh, so you are also an author of a book that is devoted to Rhinus and Aspasia mm -hmm. called Borders, Rhinus and Aspasia, mm -hmm. between Latvia and Switzerland. Where did, you, uh, where did this initiative come from when you decided to write this book about them? And was it related to some way to the fact that you have lived quite a long time in Switzerland or the fact that they are a part of Latvia's cultural heritage or perhaps just both? Um. All of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, uh, yes, uh, I've written a lot of things on Rhinus and Aspasia, not just, uh, not just this book. Um, I helped most recently. There's a new museum devoted to Rhinus and Aspasia in the Lugano, actually in Castagnola, Switzerland, uh, that uh, professionals here in Latvia helped uh, to recreate a new museum that we all opened uh, in 2018 in Lugano. I helped with that. I've, uh, so it's a long uh, association that precisely has to do with this dissertation that mm -hmm. I shouldn't have written uh, at the University of Gen Geneva back in the late 1980s. Uh, so that's when I started uh, looking into Rhinus and Aspasia. Uh, and my dissertation was related uh, to this literary couple, even though the dissertation got me a degree in political science. Couldn't pull that trick today, but I could back, <laughs> but, uh, but I certainly did, uh, was able to do it back then. Um, uh, so, and also, yes, uh, when I was, at, I, when I started my studies uh, at the Graduate Institute of International Relations in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, I had no, uh, intention of writing anything on Rhinus and Aspasia. Uh, I did the usual political science, international relations, international economics, and even international law track, you know, when you do your PhD exams and so forth. But then came time to do a, a dissertation. And I had done for a seminar a paper, a seminar that had to do with uh, intellectuals in Europe uh, between the two world war, uh, wars. And I had done something, uh, you know, on Latvia uh, at the time because uh, that was interesting to the people in the seminar, and that led one thing led to another. And the main, the tipping point was I paid a visit to Lugano, Switzerland. Have you ever been to Lugano, Switzerland? Either one of ah, uh -huh. not yet. Uh, okay, <laughs> but it's a very beautiful, stunning place. I would say it is very lovely. And uh, you know, if uh, if you need to go into exile. Uh, which is what Rhinus and Aspasia did. They spent the uh, 14 <laughs> years living uh, in Lugano before they came back here uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, to Latvia in 1920. And not a bad place mm -hmm. to, to spend, your, spend your exile, although they had many difficulties and so forth. Uh, uh, but actually, that is the place, Lugano, Cast Castagnolo, Switzerland, from which Rhinus envisaged an, an independent Latvia. Uh, you know, he, with his works and so forth, it's common knowledge that uh, he, envisioned, uh, he envisioned already during the new current times of the 1890s, but definitely in his works in 1916, 1917, which he wrote in Switzerland, uh, he created the idea uh, of uh, a Latvian state. Uh, and when I visited Lugano, and there was a little museum there uh, already then, then I started, you know, looking into it. I was, uh, you know, quite young right then, and I loved this place. And who knows, maybe subconsciously one of the reasons that I actually uh, chose to uh, look into their history further is I wanted an excuse to go back to Lugano uh, more frequently. So... Uh, and I certainly did. It's, there have been many, many trips back there and uh, uh, many, uh, not just trips, but uh, projects, research projects, uh, and other, uh, other different, uh, just other friendships and so forth that have evolved uh, out of that. So maybe in the long run, it wasn't such a bad idea to write a dissertation on the topic. I did. So it's, it's like a hobby now. 
a bit a hobby, but some people make careers, you know, out of mm -hmm. uh, writing about literary figures. But and I do have this. Uh, I have quite a few chapters written already. I do have uh, this book that is uh, still supposed to come out, but I have another book that kind of uh, went to the forefront in the race of which one needs to be finished, uh, which one needs to be finished mm -hmm. first. Uh, so Aranis and Aspasia are going to have to wait a while. <laughs> maybe you have a question to us or maybe something you want to say to our uh, listeners. No, you've, you've really uh, done some homework. I mean, everything from Rhinus uh, and Aspasia to TED Talk to you've done your, you've done your research shows. So this is like a full-time job for you. If you're, doing, <laughs> if you're doing these every week or every two weeks, uh, then uh, you, you get to know all your professors and all of your... <laughs> yes, and actually that is one of the uh, main aims of this podcast, to inform a future our current students about our professors as yeah. well as the people of uh, of RGSL yes. in general you know mm -hmm. to well, I think it's uh, yeah. your persistence in creating this and following uh, through is is wonderful that Thank you've done you. this no you. really you're much to, to be congratulated to uh, because uh, of course you're doing this all pro bono as well and that's uh, uh, and I think it's uh, you know more power to you and I hope you continue and don't kind of you know get uh, a bit tired, you know, after the 10th or the 15th <laughs> uh, <laughs> hopefully podcast. Yes. Hopefully, really hopefully. But, and uh, in a very, very uh, happy Independence Day to you. Uh, that's uh, And it yes, falls thank you. right Thanks in exam you week, doesn't it? You had this I say? finished. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I saw, Marta, you handed your exam in already on Saturday, I yes, think. So I you, you're very conscientious, so very conscientious. All yeah, right, you had, you had to do your research for this, that's why, right? <laughs> partly, partly. So partly, partly, that's what I assumed, right? No, uh, so uh, I hope at least you take uh, Wednesday the 18th off. Uh, no studying for, for exams on the 18th and, and enjoy the holiday and uh, raise a glass to, to Latvia's 102nd anniversary. Yes. Okay. So thank you. Okay, thank, thank, you, thank for, you. Thank you for joining in this healthy distance interview. Yeah. And, <laughs> and really, I think this was also very insightful for peers, for our listeners, for the community of RGSL. And really, Thank we are you. very glad. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>